Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. I invite you to join me on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as a participant in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. Today I have one of my good friends, Benjamin Lida, on our show to talk about the progymnismata. Ben, Benjamin has been on the show before in season one, uh, close to the beginning of our uh, launch of the podcast uh, with his daughter, Eden, and they shared their experiences uh, with teaching Shakespeare and doing Shakespeare plays. And so I've invited Benjamin back to talk about the progymnismata and the new curriculum that he's writing that we are going to be piloting together. Uh, let me read to you his bio, and then we will uh, cut to the chase and talk about the progem. Progem is the common, uh, the common um, abbreviation that most of us say. So Benjamin Lida has been head of a classical charter high school and founder of a Charlotte Mason inspired K through 12 school. His more than 20 years of teaching experience is wide and varied, including teaching in urban and suburban settings. In addition, Benjamin regularly works with both advanced and struggling students in public, private, and homeschooling settings. He founded and ran the Children's Shakespeare Academy, directing full productions of the Bard's plays for children ages 9 to 18. He holds a Master's of Humanities degree from the University of Dallas and is certified by the state of Texas to teach 6th through 12th grade literature, history, speech communication, and debate. He's the author of Scriptorium, Writing with the Pro Gymnasmata, a 3rd through 8th grade curriculum, which we'll be talking about today. And he is consulting and teaching at a local school in Fort Worth, Texas, and is married to his high school sweetheart, and together they are bringing up six children. And they are an absolutely lovely and delightful family, one of my favorite families. So I want to dive into, progymnismata is this huge word, and I might not even be saying it correctly. I, <laughs> I've heard it said a few different ways. Um, but it's a really important uh, program for teaching writing, and I want to dive deeply into this today with you. So before we do that, I'd like you to share with our listeners, what are the various types of writing models that most schools use today? What are their strengths and their weaknesses? Hi, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, let me tell you, first of all, Adrian, about myself. Um, I'm not a scholar. I'm a practitioner. And so the conclusions I've come to about education comes from uh, being on the front lines trying to help children become better writers. So I must have spent about 10 years trying to teach children how to write in the conventional manner. Um, and that's fourth through 12th grades in that time period uh, where I was teaching advanced classes for, and classes for struggling learners. And it didn't matter who I was teaching or where I was teaching, there was a universal problem. And that problem was the children didn't know what to write. They were constantly asking that question. You could teach them outline, you could teach them skills, you could teach them all kinds of things, and they would still say, yeah, but what do I write? So let me give you an example. Uh, so for an example, if I wanted to explain why Odysseus is a hero, right? The first thing that a conventional lesson would do is talk about the five paragraph essay. And the student asks, what do I write? So you say to him, give three reasons why Odysseus is a hero. And the child says, okay, so he's strong, he's smart, he fights for his family. And so you say to the child, okay, well, can you write a thesis using those words? And you show him how to do that. Odysseus is a hero because he's strong, smart, and he fights for his family. Never mind that the sentence lacks a parallel structure for now. But you're just trying to get something on the paper with the kids, right? Mm -hmm. And then the child says, okay, so what do I write? Okay. So you go to the next phase. Well, you're going to take one of those three things and make a topic sentence. And so the child understands he's supposed to write, well, he's strong. Uh, so now what do I write? And you roll up your sleeves now because you're right, this is getting serious because you realize you're going to have to teach this child step by step by step on how to write this paragraph about Odysseus's strength. And so you teach them the five sentence paragraph. Right? So we've got the five paragraph 
essay, and now we're teaching the five sentence paragraph. And you teach them they has to have a topic sentence. You have to write evidence. You have to have two sentences of commentary and then write a conclusion. And the child says, okay, got it. They understand outline, but he's still saying, what do I write? Because he has no idea what commentary is. These mm -hmm. words are pretty abstract. And then you realize as a teacher, well, I don't really know how to explain what commentary is. I kind of recognize it when I see it. But how do you teach a child what commentary is? So the solution that we offer children again and again is just to break things down more and more into tinier and tinier parts or offering them outlines that grow more and more rigid. So in the worst case scenarios, we end up teaching kind of a write by number system or some sort of Mad Libs process, right, where the, the child has to fill in the blanks, uh, you know, to, to write an essay. This isn't real writing, and I don't think any of us would agree that it is any kind of real writing. And we excuse it because, well, it's training, though, right? But, uh, you know, if you have an I know you do, Adrian, but if you out there listening have an experience with children narrating, you know that they're able to do a whole lot more than just fill in blanks. But anyways, when we teach it in this way, teach them the outlines, you break things into tiny pieces, they still have that same perennial question, what do I write? So I was not satisfied with this process at all, so I started digging. Um, I was not at that time in a classical school, but I knew I loved classical education. I was teaching myself and talking to friends and investigating classical schools. And as we homeschooled our own children at home, uh, trying to use a classical model at our home. And so I started digging to find, well, what is classical writing? So the first thing that I learned about classical writing is that there are five canons of rhetoric. And I don't use the fancy, you know, Latin words. I just kind of change these words for everyday use. So those five canons are invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Okay. So the problem with most contemporary writing programs is that we're actually teaching arrangement. And, and that's a great thing, by the way. We're teaching outlines are wonderful, but we're teaching arrangement and even style before we teach invention. So losing the art of invention is one of the greatest losses to teaching writing. So what are we going to do about that? Well, the children, first of all, are excellent at arrangement and style. Uh, we, we like it. We like teaching this because it's very objective. It's very easy to check off a box. You can have a child underline a use of simile, right? And we know that they've done something with style, you know, or we know that they followed an outline, it's very easy to check. So we all like that very much. Child still has to ask, what do I write though? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's funny when you bring up what do you write. I've seen firsthand, I'm going to give you a really horrible example, <laughs> because yeah. it's, it mortified me. I was visiting one of the classical schools I work with, and I will not name it. Um, but I will at least say they were new to classical. They were transitioning to a classical model, so they didn't all yeah. know exactly what to do yet. But uh, the teacher um, handed out a worksheet that had you know, a bunch of lines on it with a prompt at the top and a little picture, a little cartoon. Yeah. And this was for fourth grade because fourth grade in Texas, you have to teach writing – so they can take the star test, right? The, the, right? the standardized test, and that's the first year they're tested in writing. And, and because they don't know invention, they have to give a topic to write about, right? I was so mortified. The topic was write about your experience if your life – if you were a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could think of was if – what a horrible, like, that is not good, true, or beautiful. <laughs> like, I, I was just like, okay, and there's a little cartoon picture of a hamburger with eyeballs, and, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, if I were a hamburger, I'm going to get eaten. I'm going to hurt. I'm going to scream. This is like, a sad story. Like, this is a really mortifying <laughs> lesson for a nine-year-old to write about. That's hilarious. But what's sad is that, and, and it's funny, and we're laughing, but this is actually happening in schools all across America all the time. And yeah. obviously the teacher, so this actually goes back to the philosophy of a child. So yes. often teachers will make the mistake of bringing things down to a child level, you know, trying to make it silly or trying to make it cute or trying to make it fun rather than ennobling the child and giving them good examples of writing and lifting them up 
to their full personhood to give them the ability to form and shape their affections towards the good and true and beautiful and think about lovely things. And so it's a common mistake I see in teachers, and I know, God love them, they're trying to do what they think is best. And it's not like yeah. it was totally her fault. She was trying to make it fun. But as a, a classical educator observing this school that's transitioning to classical, I was so mortified by it. I couldn't even believe it. But then I thought about my own childhood and thought, well, those are the kind of writing lessons I was given as a little kid yeah, too. too. And it's not, it's, it's tragic because that's one of the reasons why we have kids today who go to college and the college professors say they can't even write. They can't write, right. you know, they're coming out of high school. So, so our solution, as we've talked, is about this, is going back to the tradition, going back to the pro gymnasmata. So what I'd like you to do is talk about the pro gymnasmata and what does it mean and how does it fit into the classical education model? What makes it classical? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought that story up because a lot of us, when we're teaching in homeschool or in a classical private school, we're just teaching the same way we learned. And let me tell you a little bit about the background or the history of the pro gymnasmata for those of you who haven't heard about it before. It is definitely classical. Uh, it's exactly what the ancient Greeks and Romans used to teach. In fact, we have texts, we have full texts by Anthonius, the actual handbooks that these ancient teachers of rhetoric used. And the tradition of the pro gymnasmata continued through the Middle Ages. I have on my shelf at home the rhetorical exercises of Nicephorus Basilicus. Forgive me, those Greek scholars, I may have mispronounced that name. He's a Greek of the 12th century from the Byzantine Empire. And it's a school book with numerous examples of the various exercises from the pro gymnasmata. And what's great about this book in particular is the reminder that we don't only have pagan Roman examples of writing activities. The Byzantines were Christians. So there are some really interesting prompts for personification like this. Write about what the slave of the high priest would say when his ear is cut off by St. Peter and healed by Christ. That's what they were writing about in, Greek, in Byzantium in the 13th century. Or how about this one? Write about what the blind man from birth would say upon gaining his sight. Uh, so there's some really fantastic exercises and examples of that from the 13th century. Um, they were still using this in the Renaissance. So when I started researching this 10 years ago, I found the first pro gymnasmata curriculum written not in Latin, but in English. It's Richard Reynolds, The Foundation of Rhetoric. That's from 1577. And then once you become really comfortable with all the 14 exercises, you start noticing them all over the place. You start seeing, wait, these, these classical writers are using the exercises, especially for an example, like in essays by um, Montaigne. You'll, you'll start reading and you're like, oh wait, he just did testimony. Oh, wait a minute, that was narrative, that's description. That's refutation, that's confirmation. And they're actually using the topics that we want our children to know. So we always ask, well, why are these guys such great writers <laughs> from these ancient times? They were actually trained in the pro Mana. Yes, yes, yes. And Quintilian is one of my favorite resources to read for rhetoric. And he he also, you know, spoke much of this. So I love Yeah, he's a fantastic Latin reference. And his books are actually, in my opinion, very accessible. And teachers should read Quintilian. I will put a link in the show notes. But I have personally found that his writing is quite accessible. He does write a lot like Charlotte Mason. Sometimes you're reading him and you're like, oh, this sounds like Charlotte Mason. But I think he's <laughs> actually, the translation that I have, I think he's even actually a little bit easier to understand than Charlotte Mason because some people struggle. Uh, but he, he has yeah. quite a bit to say about the pro gym because he was a rhetorician. So, um, right. yeah, yeah, this is great. It reminds me of uh, a teacher that was on our narration, um, the podcast we did a few months back on the narration panel. I was uh, interviewing a group of teachers from Coram Deo uh, Classical Academy that I worked for. And this teacher, uh, fifth, fourth or fifth grade, and she had read the story of Christmas to the children out of the Bible, the Christmas story. And mm -hmm. she had them write a narration in like first person testimony, choosing a character. Like if you're the innkeeper, yes. write a narration from the innkeeper's perspective, write a narration from the donkey's perspective. And they were beautiful. She shared them with me. And it was, I thought that was just a beautiful way to be creative with narration. Um, but it reminded me the prompt you read 
about right if if your ear were cut off, you know, from that perspective. Yes. It's really great. That that's one of the pro progems. It's personification. Mm -hmm. And you write in character. Um, so they've been doing that for literally thousands of years. It's a great activity. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, I mean, for the whole classical movement, we know that this is a multi-generational process. Uh, it's going to take some time for us to kind of understand what we're doing well enough, and hopefully the next generation can take that to the next level. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, for now, hopefully we can move on from, uh, hamburger stories. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but this is something that the pro gem can help with. Right. Um, and, and it's still a content issue, right? There's still, the problem is invention as how, what do the what are the kids actually supposed to say? And so if you did ask a kid, what is your life <laughs> as a hamburger? I mean, what, what's a kid supposed to say? If, they, you know, there's a few kids that are going to run with that. And they're going to love it. But most kids are going to say, I don't know. I've never been a hamburger. Not that they're not imaginative. They don't even have enough personal life experience to get things down on paper. And what I've learned from years and years of teaching all ages is that the, the children lack, uh, they haven't had enough life experience or they haven't read enough to have enough knowledge and content to actually write. Writing comes from ideas. First of all, writing comes from content. Uh, if what we're doing, we're flipping the whole thing over and we're teaching them a form and then telling them to smush their ideas into this form, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, what do you actually know and what can you tell me about? So, again, this is why narration is so wonderful, because you're teaching kids all about rhetoric, arrangement and style, but they don't have to stress about the content. Yes, I'm going to interrupt you because yes. <laughs> this is my hill to die on narration. So in, ca <laughs> in case somebody's listening and they don't know what narration is, explain what narration is. And one thing I want to add is that in all my years of narration, the big, exciting um, aha moment that I had several years ago in doing all of my research with narration is that narration covers all arts of the trivium. It covers grammar, logic, and rhetoric, dialectics, and rhetoric. And it covers rhetoric because all five canons of rhetoric happen when you're narrating. So when a, a student yes. is narrating, they're learning invention, they're learning arrangement, they're learning style, they're learning all of those five things and through the thought process and the retelling process so right. that then when they go to write, they actually have those ideas in that process sort of established. But I want you to explain to our listeners uh, your experience with narration before we keep going into the pro gymnasmata. I'm sorry I interrupted you, but let's camp on narration just for a minute and, and tell our listeners about that. Well, narration is the bedrock of rhetoric. I 100% agree. And we want children narrating as young as possible, as soon as possible, everything and anything. And for those of you new to narration, uh, I'll just tell it to you this way. Any child can narrate all day long about a movie they saw or their favorite cereal boxes or, you know, whatever it is that happened in a given day. They can narrate. They have an amazing capacity to remember things. And so we don't have to train them how to narrate very much. Uh, but what our responsibility is, is putting in front of them delightful and beautiful and good and true things. And those are the things we want them to narrate. So that means when they're little or reading great books, great poetry, or I should say good books and good poetry, um, things that um, they don't even necessarily have to understand all of the vocabulary, but present them to something that's delightful and beautiful enough. Uh, and, and by the way, let me, let me interrupt myself and say, when we're presenting books above a child's level, the way I see this is very much like the scripture when it says, you know, scattering your seeds and you don't know which will prosper, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. Um, that's what we're doing. Uh, we we want to sow broadly. We want to sow all over the place, all kinds of great things, and not second guess ourselves. Oh well, they won't like this, or or they won't understand this because you don't know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. So we start with narration as a foundation of all rhetoric, and as the children move into the progemismata, which I would recommend starting third or fourth grade, um, we take narration and we've kind of moved it a little bit forward. For an example with a fable, which is always the first step in the uh, progenus mata. With a fable, it's just an extension of narration with one difference. You ask the child to tell the moral. If you give them the moral, then we haven't progressed at all in our rhetoric. But if you let them come up with it, you've just taught them how to do literary analysis. You've just taught them how to think about what they're narrating and draw conclusions. 
Uh, and this is something that I know that public schools, for an example, struggle constantly. How do you teach kids to make inferences? How do you teach them to draw conclusions? You start with a fable. That's exactly how you do it. And they're able to do that because the stories are developmentally appropriate. They're very concrete. Um, they're delightful. They're easy to remember. Um, so this is actually the first start, uh, first step of the progemis mana. That progemis mana helps with that uh, topic of invention by giving them the content to begin with. And then as they grow and grow and grow in their content, uh, they are able to invent more. The, the root of the word uh, invention is the same as inventory. And so when you have a topic or a question that you ask, like, tell this fable, tell me the opposite, tell me about this virtue, et cetera, the child takes an inventory of what they already know. And so if you have been uh, narrating, uh, letting those ch children narrate for years and years, all kinds of stories and Bible stories and poems, that's their inventory. And they start learning through these topics, through the exercises of the pro gymnast mata, they start learning how to take all that content knowledge to arrange it in a proper, uh, an appropriate form and put it on paper. And there you are, you begin to make essays. Okay, tell us, tell our listeners what the pro gymnast mata is. You've got us going on the fable. I know that's the beginning and it's exercises and steps. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so pro gymnast mata, it means proto exercises or first exercises. They're the exercises that should be fun and exciting for the children because they're not developmentally appropriate. It's not developmentally appropriate for them to start working on the formal academic essay when they're 12 years old. Um, so they're, these are, this is what you do first. Um, so uh, there are 14 of them. And uh, the beautiful thing about the pro gym is that you don't leave behind the old exercises, but the next exercise, number two, number three, number four, remembers the old exercises, they roll them together, there's a sort of snowball effect so that um, uh, these, the, the, the writing experience becomes richer and richer uh, with each stage. Tell us a little bit about how it's unique and why it's actually needed. There are a few pro gymnasmata curriculums on the market, but explain how yours is different and why we need it. So there's a lot of modern systems we've already talked about, um, and they try to cram ideas into outlines. Um, they don't begin with the ideas. They begin with five sentences or five paragraphs that you have to cram into a rigid form. Um, so modern writing uh, begins with the pieces and tries to get the child to paste it all together. Um, the classical way, the pro mata, it begins with the idea, and then you find the form that fits the idea. So I've taught both ways. I've taught the conventional way and I've taught this classical way. And I would say one of the biggest differences is that the modern way is more analytical and the classical way is delightful. And I've seen that because the kids enjoy it more. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me give you an example. So if I say to a sixth grader that we're going to write an essay on the virtue of courage, and again, if I said something like, well, give me topic, sentence, evidence, and commentary, this is very abstract, but when I'm teaching with Projmas Mata, I'll say, we're going to write about courage. Can you tell me a story about courage? Can you narrate that? Can you tell me the opposite? What's the opposite of courage? Can you narrate a story about that? Can you, can you find a proverb that we've talked about and memorized or that, that actually teaches on courage? And so they can say yes to all of those questions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what these topics and inventions are. Um, and, and in my curriculum, um, I find that the children can move along very quickly because these topics are very simple, they're concrete, uh, it makes sense to the children, they can say yes to them, right? So instead of just spending a whole year on one of the pro gym exercises, I find that, well, let's go ahead and, and start on the next one, and we'll do two or three or four, depending on their age level uh, of exercises. And uh, then the children are able to kind of get a broader experience and, and more styles of writing uh, in that one year. Mm -hmm. So in my curriculum also, there's lots of extension activities. So there's ways and there's approaches that you can actually start applying the pro gym to other curriculum. I'm sorry, to other subject matters. Uh, so you can teach them how to write about picture studies or nature studies or history or literature. Um, so those are some... some some really um, useful tools as well. Right. So you're integrating. That's lovely. I love that. Yeah. Um, one of the other um, thoughts I had with Pro Gymnasmata is how uh, I've noticed that teachers that use a Pro Gymnasmata curriculum in the classroom tend to 
still want to lean on creating these rubrics and uh, checklists where they're having children do peer reviews and edits and rewrites. Do you have any thoughts about that? It's a really big paradigm shift um, in terms of how do we assess their writing, right? Um, and I think that uh, for me personally, I would say that they don't need assessment in the early years. They need the experience. And what I would encourage people to do instead of uh, grading is give the children an opportunity to go through all five of the canons of rhetoric. And the last one is presentation. It's delivery. And let them actually read um, their essays to their classmates. Um, we had, I had a great experience uh, with this um, at the school I was running a few years back before COVID, and we had some guests visiting, and they were hoping to start a school similar to ours, very much inspired by Charlotte Mason out west. And they saw the kinds of essays that our children were producing because they saw the presentations, and they said to me, how did you get your children to write like that? Um, so presentation, I think, is really good for everybody because we're sharing in that way, not critically, but we're sharing with openness and the kids can learn from that. They're going to hear how another kid approached that same subject matter and they're going to learn from that without actually having to put red marker on their papers, without them having to be penalized in some kind of arbitrary degrading system. But the experience becomes very positive and it's still very cooperative and it's still very educational. Mm -hmm. So um, another question I have is I've noticed in a lot of schools, and I think a lot of classical schools have, have done a great job at bringing narration into their model. A lot of schools are starting to do narration, but a mistake that I've seen them make is they're only like a lot of the professional development I do at schools for narration, they just want it for K-5, right? And so they're not really aware or un maybe understanding that narration is still great for sixth through 12th grade. Um, but I would like you to talk about how uh, how the pro gymnasmata writing fits, because a lot of times we think, oh, we're doing writing now, we don't need to narrate anymore. So how do they fit together? And do, do you think that children should keep er narrating orally while they're doing the pro gymnasmata? Uh, there should be an abundance of narration through eighth grade. Uh, and my curriculum encourages that as well. In whatever excerpts that we're using, they need to narrate mm -hmm. those first. That's their kind of primary experience with the text. Your primary experience has to be very uh, well, well experiential. <laughs> You're not highlighting and underlining and, and, and breaking it into pieces, right? But getting the wholeness of it first, right? Mm -hmm. There are some ways that when they get into middle school, that we can start talking about ways that they can ask questions and kind of analyze the text, if you want to use that word. But the primary experience of that is the narrative experience, and that's the first thing that they need to do. Uh, in high school, it becomes a little bit uh, less practical to spend a lot of time narration just simply because of the, the, the mass of the text that you have to digest. Uh, but there's other ways you could do that. You could focus on particular materials. You can have them uh, narrate to their neighbor and have many people narrating all at the same time. Turn to your neighbor and narrate what we just read. You know, and have you can have 10 people narrating at once, uh, and that way you can have a lot more children having that responsibility of narration, that responsibility to remember, that responsibility to know what they heard without having to spend 30 minutes listening to everybody's narration. So there's some ways that you can adjust it in high school. Uh, in addition, in high school, you might also want to uh, use an outline, uh, a kind of an outline narration. Uh, where students are responsible on paper to just kind of give a summary of each of the paragraphs, um, which I found that is actually very useful for students who are very intimidated by more complex texts. It helps them um, understand, if I only understand this much of this paragraph, that's okay. And then they get a little more comfortable and they start writing down three or four words instead of one. And then they get a little more comfortable with that and they start understanding larger and larger sections of the text. Um, so there are definitely some adjustments you make in high school, um, but there's still a lot of narrative principles that we want to hold on to even then. Mm -hmm. So if, if a student is coming in to a school that, say, is using a pro gymnasmata curriculum and has been using it for, you know, a couple of years, and this student is coming in as a sixth grader, um, how do they deal with a student who's not had any experience with the pro gymnasmata in third, fourth, and fifth grade, and they're jumping into sixth grade, is this a problem? How do do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, we, we, we did confront this um, some years ago at St. George's School, uh, uh, where we would have students coming from homeschool backgrounds. We had students coming from public school backgrounds. Um, I mean, there's there's an idea out there that's not a bad idea, 
uh, very much inspired by Charlotte Mason, that if you just have the kids reading, 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 reading beautiful and great texts, writing becomes very natural. And you don't have to spend a lot of time on composition instruction. Um, but that's just not the reality that we have in our schools and our classrooms. We have children coming from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, so my curriculum actually deals with that because what we do is that we actually start back at fable with every single year. So in the first year, you go through fable, description, narration, uh, proverb, anecdote. Those are some of the exercises we do early on, and we spend more time on them. But by the time you get to eighth grade, we'll spend at least one week on fable, narrative, anecdote, proverb, go on to encomium, get on to refutation and confirmation, and you move your way up and you spend more time on those um, higher up level exercises. Um, and in this way, if the child has no experience with, say, narration, if they have no experience with any of the other progis mata, uh, they're still going to get exposure to that with each year's lesson. Um, because otherwise, you have this problem where um, with some of the curriculums that are out there, a child comes in in the middle of it, and it's they've missed a lot. There's a lot of gaps. Um, so I wanted to make a program where you can take this in any situation, start off with kids from all kinds of backgrounds, and they're going to understand what they need to understand and move on. Mm -hmm. And this curriculum can be used in any kind of school, like homeschool and a classroom? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's going to be able to, you could use it in a, in a homeschool situation. You could use it in a private school. Uh, I would love to see it in a public school. I mean, based on a lot of the state standards, it's not going to happen because they're trying to make the the 11 year olds um, mm -hmm. write topic sentence, evidence, commentary, commentary, <laughs> Wow, <laughs> which is not developmentally appropriate, mm -hmm. but I would love to see it all over the place uh, because it's a more natural progression. Uh, it's more developmentally, developmentally appropriate uh, because we start with the concrete, we go to the abstract, we talk, start with the normative, and then we move to the more in the upper levels, more um, uh, debatable topics. So everything moves in a very kind of, developmentally appropriate fashion. So I want our listeners to know a little bit about this pilot that we're going to be partnering in together because I think it's important. Um, we're going to be launching, actually the website now is up that if anybody's interested, they can uh, fill out the form and, and we will get back with them about an application for this pilot. Um, you want to tell our listeners a little bit about the pilot and, and uh, how we're launching this? We're going to be piloting this curriculum next year, and we're really excited about it. Um, we really hope that a lot of schools uh, are on board with wanting to try this out. We're going to give a discounted rate because we need your feedback. We want your feedback. We want to have a trial run uh, for teachers of all kinds of schools, homeschool families, uh, private schools, schools who have a classical background, schools that are transitioning to classical background, schools who are just tired of the same old and they want to try something new. I want to hear feedback from all of you um, so that we can improve the curriculum and make it more ready for all kinds of students. Um, and I think that's really important to me. I think it's a really beautiful part of this kind of education is it really is an education for everybody. Um, so the more feedback I get from a more wide variety of people who are interested in this, the more I would appreciate it. And I hope it'll be a blessing to you and your students and your family as well. So I would reach out to Adrian. Uh, and um, beautiful teaching, and I believe that there is a pilot page up there. So if you're looking for more information, um, we can reach out to her. Yes, beautiful teaching at gmail.com. Uh, but just fill out the form on there because I need to gather the information to email you back uh, the application and the overview. Actually, the overview is on the website too. So my concluding questions for all of my uh, podcast guests, I have one of, you can choose one of two. Uh, you can either give me a quote from a book that has had a huge impact on you or a book that you wish you had read sooner in your life. Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a quote, but I can tell you about a book uh, that I love dearly, and I wish I had read it earlier. And I mention it mostly because I think not a lot of people know about it. Um, but uh, Hilaire Belloc, he was a friend with Chesterton. Uh, they were very good friends. In fact, I think Chesterton illustrated a few of uh, Belloc's books. Um, it's kind of some illustrations and silly, silly pictures that he drew. Uh, but Belloc is a fantastic writer, and he has a book called The Four Men. And The Four Men is, it's very difficult to describe, but it is four days. It is a man who calls himself myself, who meets three other men, 
who called themselves Grizzlebeard, the sailor, the poet. And these four men, who are almost archetypes of sorts, right, go on a journey home. And they talk about longing to see home again, just as Odysseus longed to see the smoke coming from the chimneys of his home. And there's images of Eden, and it's all in Sussex. So if you're, <laughs> if you're an Anglophile, you're going to love it for that. Uh, but they just take a journey through the countryside, avoiding the wealthy, avoiding the cities, trying to find the best pubs and inns where they can enjoy a good draft and sing a song. And and uh, uh, many times you're reading this story and you're like, what is this? Is this just a big joke? Is this just a silliness? They tell funny stories about the time St. Dunstan grabbed the devil by his nose with tongs. And it makes you laugh out loud. But as you go through the story, you realize there is a lot more going on here because we see these archetypes of the soul going on a journey together. Um, we see almost a transfiguration at the end, spoiler. And we also see this longing for home, you know, pointing to, pointing to, you know, that longing for our eternal home deep down within each of us. So every time I go back and read that story, I just, you, you feel everything you want to feel, uh, you, you know, when you read literature. Uh, you enjoy all those experiences you want to enjoy when you read literature. Uh, but then you come away from it saying, that's it. And you're not even sure what it is, <laughs> but you know you got something out of it. Yeah. But it's the kind of book that you, you read it again. What was that again? And you read it again. You're like, oh, that's it. It's yeah. beautiful. It's exactly the way literature should work. I love so it. I wish I had read that earlier. What's it called? It's called The Four Men. The Four Men. Hilary we'll, Belloc. We'll put that in the show notes. All yes. right. Well, thank you so much, Ben. I look forward to continuing to work with you. And this is such an important project. And I'm that's why I'm doing a whole episode on it. I'm just so grateful for the work you do and have done for the classical world and the Charlotte Mason world. Actually, there are two in one. <laughs> uh, thank you so much again. And thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely, Adrian. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. You can get involved in a few ways. There's a Facebook page where we actively discuss the ideas around classical education. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. And if you want to help offset our production costs, you can support the podcast financially by going to www.classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash support. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once said, Well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven.